Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, first uh, AT&T uh, Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Tony Villamila, I'm your Dean of the School of Business, uh, and appreciate very much you being here. I'm sure more people will be tricking in uh, as, as we go through the, uh, the presentation. This is the first of lecture series that has to do with uh, entrepreneurship innovation, uh, what I call the can-do attitude of executives, how you can get it done. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have the Vice President and General Manager of AT&T for South Florida here, Carlos Blanc, to be with us. I appreciate very much the sponsorship that you're providing to, to our school. And, uh, this, is, uh, this is a forum for discussion. So uh, the, the panelists that you'll see, we'll start now with what I call the panel for larger companies. These are companies that had a start, but at the same time, you have executives who have made these companies grow. So instead of just being an, being an entrepreneur, where you start a company and you risk land, labor, and capital, you put your capital at risk, these are, these are intrapreneurs in many ways. In other words, you have to constantly innovate, you have to constantly produce new services, new products, in the kind of highly competitive economy that we have. We call it, we call it the Darwinian economy. Survival of the fittest, survival of the of those who can do better, survival of the adaptable. So um, this this lecture series will uh, will enlighten you in many areas. So we start with the larger companies, leaders of these companies in media, telecommunications, real estate investments, uh, and we have also the uh, uh, in um, in accounting and, and financial services uh, are here today. So. Again, uh, welcome. We very much appreciate this. I'm, I'm going to introduce the panel and ask questions to the panelists. And then uh, I'll, after a certain period of time, after these questions, we'll open up for discussion. And I hope all of you students who are here uh, have good questions. There's no th such a thing as a bad question. So uh, we appreciate very much any ideas, questions that you have. How can you start a company? How do you can get employed in, your, in that company? Or any other issues that we have a number of faculty members here from the school too. Any other issues that, that you see in the specific areas? Uh, so, to, to my right, uh, I'm going to introduce first uh, Carlos Blanco, that I mentioned, the uh, Vice President General Manager for AT&T of South Florida. Not a small company, right? Uh, but also a company with uh, with a lot of potential possibilities and challenges that he will be discussing. That is. Uh, he has a, had a distinguished career in telecommunications. Uh, by the way, if you want to read a lot of their bios, otherwise I can spend one hour doing that, um, you'll have them here in, in the program, uh, all their distinguished record and all the things they have done throughout their careers. But uh, Carlos has been in uh, distinguished career in telecommunications. He's been with Bell South in Latin America. He's been in Puerto Rico. So has a tremendous uh, portfolio uh, of, of career uh, development. And he'll tell us a little bit about some of these uh, challenges and opportunities that he has faced throughout his career and with his company. To his right is uh, one that I know very well. I've been in the board of directors of Spanish Broadcasting System, SBS, uh, since 2004. Is a diversified media company that his late father and Mr. Alarcon uh, Jr. started uh, uh, several, several decades ago. And now they have uh, 20 uh, uh, radio stations throughout the U.S., many of them uh, award-winning radio stations, and also lamusica.com, which is the, the way that they have introduced themselves into the digital media of music. And uh, in the last uh, several years, a startup company called uh, La Mega TV, television here for South Florida, and he can tell you about some of the opportunities and challenges there. So we appreciate very much uh, you being here with, with us. Uh, to my left uh, here is uh, Manny de Sarraga, who's the Executive Managing Director of uh, Holiday, Fenoglio, and Fowler, LP, HFF. They, Manny heads up the capital markets group in terms of real estate investments uh, and among other activities. He's, for, he's actually overlooking that expansion of the capital markets platform. And many of these distinguished professionals that we have here today, remember, if you look at their bios, they also give back to the community. So in many ways, this is social entrepreneurship. Uh, they are members of the United Way, they're members of Habitat for Humanity, they're members of major uh, caring type organizations too. 
is the fact that you're in business, you can also contribute to the community in terms of uh, involvement in, in charitable organizations and their own activities, creating employment and opportunities. Um, to his left is uh, summa cum laude from, uh, from, uh, from uh, our own university, St. Thomas University, uh, an alum, uh, 18, uh, 1981, I would say 18. I've coming back here, it's like a time war. <laughs> you don't know as same as I am, but anyway, uh, 1981, uh, distinguished alum, uh, summa cum laude, uh, Oscar Suarez, who has had a CPA, uh, a very important career uh, in uh, Ernst and Young, uh, all the way from overseeing not only the South Florida practice, but now overseeing the whole Florida practice of Ernest and Young. You know, one of the big six uh, accounting and, and financial services <laughs> firms. Um, Thirty-one years of public uh, public accounting experience. No, yeah. thirty. Yeah, thirty-one well, years. I got it right. <laughs> so this is the uh, distinguished panel. So we have a diversity of a uh, very diversified group of uh, executives uh, and leaders in their own field. And um, I'll start then um, asking questions. Um, so I, I would like each of them, please, uh, maybe we'll start now with the left, um, since we started with the right before. So it has to be bipartisan. Um, <laughs> three left. Three left. Uh, I don't think. I don't think <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, um, many, if you can please share a brief overview of your company, what it does, and, and uh, what are some of the issues and challenges you're facing. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. I, um, our firm is a real estate capital markets firm, investment banking, and uh, our business is uh, arranging financing for projects. Uh, uh, joint ventures, securities offerings to create funds. Uh, we also manage commercial mortgages. Um, we are a public company with New York Stock Exchange. We have uh, 550 employees. We have 20 offices around the country. And uh, and I'm I've been with the firm since we put it together, um, which was back in 2001. I, I basically aggregated a couple firms and created it, and then we took it public later on. So. Did I answer your question? Yes. Uh, and I'm the only guy who with braces, I think, in the room, maybe in the university. <laughs> so. Thank you. Oscar, you want to tell us a little bit about, uh, everybody knows about arms and young, but a little bit about your firm. Well, you, you may have braces, but you still have hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> but, uh, Tony, Gigi, uh, the faculty, the students, uh, and to my uh, fellow uh, colleagues here, uh, on the panel, thank you, thank you for for being for letting me be here, and uh, and to tell part of my story. Um, this is a flashback. You know, Gigi was walking me through the halls and all that. I spent a lot of time here, and I uh, graduated in '81. I uh, uh, originally went to high school at Pace next door, and um, uh, I was very fortunate to receive a scholarship to attend what was then Biscayne College, and and uh, the rest is somewhat history. Um, and I spent a lot of time in this building uh, studying and, and, uh, and working at the same time. Um, so I, I owe a lot to the school and, uh, and the faculty for having me, uh, having prepared me. Uh, Ernst & Young uh, is one of the big four, not six, Tony, because Anderson kind of got, had to go away and then the other one was merged in. But we're down to four firms. Um, just to, to tell you the sheer size of the, of the four firms, if you took five, six, and merged them together, they still wouldn't be number four. If you took five, six, seven, and eight and merged them together, they still wouldn't be number four. If you took five and everyone else and merged them together, they still wouldn't be number four. That's how big the big four are, and that's why the name exists. We're a professional services firm. At the core of what we do is we provide uh, a financial statement on it. And uh, that's about 50%, 45% to 50% of what we do. We are the auditors of Manny's company. And in fact, we provide services to uh, both uh, uh, Spanish Broadcasting and AT&T, not on the audit side, but tax and advisory services. So typically, uh, every major corporation in the world, uh, we're either doing uh, business with them by either auditing them or providing some other sort of service. 
We have 160,000 employees, actually 167,000 employees around the world in 143 countries. And in the state of Florida, we have six offices. Uh, we have about a thousand employees in those six offices, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Orlando, Boca, and Miami. And um, that's a little bit about who we are and what I've done. Thank you. Well, that's great. That, you know, uh, uh, auditors are very much needed, and those of you studying accounting, it's a, it's a great profession, a CPA, accounting. As an economist, can I say a joke about auditor? You could. <laughs> then you can say a joke about economists. Yeah, I will. <laughs> but actually, actually, EY is much more diversified, as you know. I mean, right. you, know, you have uh, tax, tax planning, you have all kinds of different uh, professional services. But uh, for an economist, the definition of an auditor is the one who comes after a bloody battle and violates the wounded, you know, afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's okay. I mean, you know, I just, uh, just wanted to say that, but, but actually we're very proud to have you, especially as an alum of uh, EY, and you're right, it's big for uh, I'm still thinking the old, the old way, you know, without without Arthur Anderson. Um, I would like to, the same thing, overview of the company and what it does and maybe some of the challenges. We can talk about challenges later. Uh, Mr. Black, if you would like to. Yes, and I like to stand with you. some people here that I yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, You know, saying what AT&T does could be very easy and very difficult. Uh, if we were in 2003, uh, probably I would say that we're in a company with mobile communications and texting. If we go back to, 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 to 2007, then the iPhone came and that changed a little bit of things. So then in 2008, all the app, apps from the App Store started. So I would say that the best way to describe AT&T today is a lifestyle company. Uh, the company is 136 years old. Actually, the original company was bought by one of the daughters, which is a total of merger. But Today we are we're, we're everywhere and we want to be in more places. I mean, we, we are in the house, we're in the car, we, we are in everything you guys do for your work, for your play, for your, for your travel, for whatever. So we are defining ourselves more and more as a lifetime company through telecommunications, through service, to keeping you close to the people that you like, to the information that you need, to your entertainment, your games, whatever, to your school. So uh, I would say that our, our challenge is to help define and be in the forefront of what being a lifetime company is within the things that we do. So. One of the things is that we, we, we talked about is the, uh, I'm a, I'm a black, Blackberry person, okay? <laughs> and it's all right, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, right? And you're starting now with a new Blackberry. Can you tell them a little bit? Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the challenges. Everybody was a Blackberry person. I think that Blackberry, uh, like uh, Apple and, and AT&T, by the way, revolutionized the industry by introducing the first smartphones with the iPhone uh, in 2007. BlackBerry was the first company that had a very robust solution for giving you your email in your pocket. I mean, before that, there were a lot of attempts, but nobody, nobody like BlackBerry uh, provided a secure, robust system. And, and they were so successful that they made a mistake that a lot of companies do. They were so invested in the past successes that they didn't notice that the iPhone arrived. They didn't notice that the App Store arrived. <laughs> they didn't notice that Android came, that Windows came, that all these things came. And uh, they went from like 30% market share worldwide to less than 10% today, in a matter of five years. They got it now, I think. So. I saw the new phone yesterday. Uh, we're launching it probably at the end of March. It's amazing. So, uh, you know, talking about reinventing yourself, yes. intrapreneur, right. uh, you know, having the, the courage to part, to, to depart from the things that made you successful in the past and start all over again uh, by reinventing yourself every few years or every few days or every few weeks uh, uh, is something very, very remarkable and they're doing it. So, very, very interesting uh, situation with Black Bear. This is a significant management challenge, as you can see, and for all of us, students, faculty, uh, professionals, you know, we have to constantly reinvent ourselves and constantly be on, on the move in the new global economy of the 21st century with a lot of uh, technology-intensive activities. You know, a lot of industries are becoming obsolete, new industries are being developed, and if you rest on your laurels and you think, well, you know, I got a degree from St. Thomas or a master's or or I'm a PhD, you know, and you don't go into this new technologies and new way of thinking, uh, you probably fall by the wayside. And I think that's a very classic management example uh, for all of us to have. <coughs>
Mr. Connell, please. Thank Let's you, uh, Tony. Thank you for the invitation. Thank uh, also I want to thank St. Thomas University for this great honor. Um, it's nice to be on a dais with uh, so many large companies. I'm probably the smaller company here, but um, very proud to be the uh, the largest Hispanic-owned and controlled media, publicly traded media company in the U.S. Uh, SBS today uh, had, its, had its originally, uh, historically, its origins in terrestrial radio. But today we are, we continue to be in radio, we're in television, we're, uh, we have online properties, and we are the largest uh, independent promoter of Hispanic concerts and events, targeting, obviously, Hispanic consumer uh, in the United States and operating in the seven largest U.S. Hispanic markets, uh, which are, in no particular order, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco, Puerto Rico, which we consider to be part of the U.S., and, uh, and Houston. And so it's a very challenging time for media. Maybe we'll get a little bit into this a little bit later on. Um, but I think the company has been, thankfully, successful at adapting. I think adaptation to the environment uh, is a very important ingredient, particularly in the last three or four years where I think we can all agree that it's been an economic debacle, not only in this country, but uh, universally speaking. And um, hopefully we are, uh, by virtue of being and opening up different revenue lines and uh, different applications, to use the words we used before, uh, we, we have prepared for the future by adapting and not staying static as to what the company has been. This year we will uh, celebrate our 30th anniversary. Uh, began the company's <coughs> operations in 1983 as an AM station in New York, so we're very happy about the progress and very expectant about the future. To ask a question now, we, we talked about the companies and some of the management challenges, but I'd like to uh, get personal on a positive way. Um, talk a little about about uh, what made you what what where's the uh, knowledge that you acquired? How come you acquired knowledge from your present for your present position? In other words, what are you the person? What are some of the challenges? What are the education that that you went through? What are some of the positive aspects as you went through your career? and your current positions, and, and then what are some of the mistakes and challenges that you make. So I'd like to get a more, uh, each of you, you know, the personal side in terms of uh, what do you see in, in the future? You know, we have a lot of students here. Uh, what are some of the attributes? What are some of the challenges? Some of the mistakes you made? Um, and what kind of training you needed to achieve your current position? I appreciate that very much. Maybe we can start with Carlos, maybe. Okay, why do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, right here, Carl. <laughs> you know, I would start saying, I would start by saying that life is great because with time, the mistakes become learning opportunities. Right. So if you ask me today where I am, Carlos, what mistakes you made? Uh, I can think of a lot of different times in my life with, you know, I thought that my life was ending, that the world was falling, the sky was falling, and then by being persistent and, 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 and being very sure of yourself and, and of, your, of, of your abilities, and, uh, and you know, you, you overcome them, and then later they just become, you know, learning opportunities, you know, uh, uh, memories of learning opportunities that you went through. Um, I think that, that the, the knowledge has two big areas, I would say. One is academic, and the other one is, is what, what, you know, the, the, the influence you get from, from the outside. Uh, I personally am a telecom engineer. I, I am from Venezuela. I graduated in Venezuela a long time ago, 36 years ago. <laughs> I graduated very young. But, um, uh, uh, but, but I started traveling uh, immediately. I was lucky to get a, a job in Latin America. I started traveling in Latin America when I was 23 years old. So that really helped me a lot understanding that you know, I was not as good or as bad as I thought. And that getting perspective from other people is very, very important. I mean, uh, always being open uh, to, to learn from people. You know, and from people that probably at first sight, you think they don't have anything to, to teach you. Uh, 
if you give them a chance, you learn a lot from everyone. So, you know, being so young and traveling in Latin America, different places, different, different countries, uh, the islands in the Caribbean, that really helped me put a lot of perspective there. Then I got married, and then, with one kid, I went back to school. Uh, you know, to, to NYU, by the way, for, the, for my maths. And uh, that was very tough. You know, one kid, broke, New York City, uh, two jobs, and a full-time MBA. And uh, I think that what kept me going was, you know, that, that vision. That, that It doesn't matter what's happening to you today. If you have your sight where you want to go, and you really are learning and, and going through all of that, you, you can really, really uh, make that just uh, you know, a, a difficult time in your life but come out stronger on the other side. So the, the, you know, learning about the outside, being informed, you know, look at the news, see what's going on. I mean, what, what's happening with the economy? How's that will influence you, the things that you need to learn, the things, the works that, the jobs that you might want to get. You know, talk to people. Talk to, to, to your teachers, talk to your executives, talk, you know, call me, whatever. Uh, try to, to absorb a lot from what's going outside. You know, we tend to be a lot of self-centered, and that's good, it's necessary because you need to also to know yourself. But being always knowing where you are, what the environment is telling you and learning from that, I think it's helped me a lot. Because at the end, you are more valuable to any company or any organization when you know what is going on outside of the walls of your influence you. How is that going to, to affect what you do and, and then the more you know and the more informed you are, then you can react better, you can adjust better. Uh, you know, the, 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 what Raul was saying, his business has changed dramatically over, over the years and they've been able to adapt because they've been paying attention to what's going outside. So do not take the eye out of your academic learning. I think that's important, do it at your own pace. We all have our own situation. But never, never stop studying academically but also study life, study with people, is to learn from other people. That will give you a great perspective also to apply what you do. That's what's worked for me so far. Oh, thank so. you. That's it. And Raul, you want to say a few words? Please? Yeah, sure. Um, and to echo something that uh, Carlos said, mentioned, I think it's important for any student today, uh, if I were to say what I thought were the most important things that I could impart to them with respect to the future, I think, first of all, you have to identify whatever it is that your passion is. You have to be clearly knowledgeable of what it is that you like to do, what it is that motivates you, what it is that excites you. Uh, because I think that's 99% of the equation. The problem is the last 1% is very, is very difficult too. And But I would boil that down in my own case, I would boil it down to a word, and the word, and, and Carlos echoed this word, I think the word is perseverance. Uh, I'll tell you a quick little story. I got into this business, I was very lucky, because my father was a radio announcer in Cuba, and so I grew up in that environment, my father playing records until two or three in the morning, and you know, that kind of a thing. And I learned a, a lot about that, and I developed a passion for it. But I got into actually the business of broadcasting because I wanted so badly, so badly, to have an FM Spanish FM station in New York City. And it's 1989, which is a long time ago. But there was no Spanish FM in New York City. There was none. So what am I to do? What am I going to do? I learned from my father about radio. I learned about music. We had a little recording studio, so I knew the artists. I knew the advertising agencies. I knew the DJs that would come to record. And I wanted to be in it really bad. So you know what I did? I took out a piece of paper, and I started with 92.3, all the way on the left of the dial, 107. I can still rattle them off today. 92.3, 93.1, 93.9, 94.7, 95.1. All the way to 107.5. And I called every owner. I mean, I mean, you know, I was like, I was a kid. And I called every owner. I said, I'd like to buy your radio station. I'm going to tell you this funny story because this is one that, that I eventually wound up buying. But i got to tell you this story. It only takes a second. 
I called 97.9. I called the station was owned by a Yiddish organization <laughs> of all things. And there was spoken word, FM, but there was no FM music in New York, in Manhattan. And I wanted it really bad. So I called this um, lovely gentleman, Harold Ostrom, who was running a company called the Forward Association. And they, would, they printed a newspaper in Yiddish, and they had this FM station for Yiddish talk on FM. And I, and I couldn't believe Anyway, I called him. I said, now, Mr. Ostrov, uh, this is Mr. Ostrov. Yes. Um, well, I, I, I wanted to know whether there would be any possibility of my buying your FM station. And he said, this is, this is contextual. He said, listen to me, young man. I will never sell that radio station. Do you hear me? Never, ever. <laughs> and, he, and he slammed down the phone. Now, I did wind up buying the station. Yes, I did. But, but and this is very important, the answer was very clear. He's not going to sell me the radio station. So I said, how do I get it? How do I get it? And I started to think about well, he doesn't need an FM station for spoken language in the metropolitan area. And there's one thing I didn't say about the story. He depended a lot on contributions. So I thought to myself, he doesn't need an FM. He needs an AM, and he needs an AM with a big signal, something that can cover from Philadelphia to Boston. So I called him up, and I said, Mr. Ostroff, it's me again. I, I thought he was going to throw the phone again. I said, I have an idea. How about if I give you an AM? has much more territory to cover. And you give me the FM and I'll give you some money. I'll give you the AM plus some money and you give me the FM. And I was ready for him to throw the phone down. He says, that's interesting. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's an interesting. And to make a long story short, I don't want to take the time. No, please, that's we fine. wound up doing the deal. I bought an AM station from, uh, who was it? It was Emmis. Emmis had bought the AM station from NBC. He didn't want the AM station, so he sold it to me. I didn't want the AM station. I remember wanted the FM. And so I bought the AM, I gave it to Harold, he gave me the FM, and I went on the air in February of 1989 with the first New York FM in Spanish language. So that's a long way of my telling <coughs> the students here today that a passion is a necessary ingredient. It's 99%. But that other 1%, is not taking no for an answer. You can never take no for an answer. I have a funny thing that I happen to believe in. The more they say no, the more I know I'm going to get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because life has shown me that. Anyway, that's what I'm I haven't known him for many years, and he's right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matty, you want to tell us a little bit? Uh, sure. Well, uh, I always stole two of my words, which were passion and perseverance which I'll get back to in a minute. Um, in my firm, we hire people typically out of college, or a graduate, or undergraduate, or sometimes out of law school. And we like to hire them without experience. And we look for a couple things. One Number one thing I look for is passion, and which I was referring to, which is a real love for wanting to do what we have, what our business is, which is finance and capital markets and real estate. Uh, two, I look for personality. So I look for someone who can express himself very well in front of a group, can, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you can tell has, um, you know, it's just comfortable with people. Um, three, I look for intellect. So I look for smart people. And it doesn't mean that you are the top of the class, but you could be street smart, you could be intellectually smart, etc. And I have uh, people that are, you know, young people have hired. I hired people from Ivy League schools. I've hired people from non-Ivy League schools. And I hired one fellow whose dad had a, um, what do you call it, fondita, a little Cuban restaurant near Jackson Memorial Hospital. And this guy would work the, uh, where they sell the Cafe Guano right up front. And, and they would sell chickens, et cetera, right near, uh, you know, cooked chicken, et cetera. And he was negotiating every day with people at the, uh, at the, uh, right there at the, the stand. And that guy has an amazing negotiation ability. Um, and that guy today does deals that are $200 million, $300 million, et cetera. Um, yet, I may interview a kid from Harvard University, and the kid um, carries the Harvard crush right on his shoulder and says, you know, I'm from 
Harvard, et cetera, et cetera, but he has no personality no, uh, and no passion when you get down to it. So, so that's what I look for, and I think just, just guiding thoughts in terms of, of um, what I see as success, particularly in our field or any, any field. And people within our firm, they typically join our firm and they're with us. They're with us 15, 20 years, et cetera. So that's that part. In terms of my, myself personally, uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in Westchester. Um, nobody was telling me, guiding me as to what I should be doing or not be doing. I actually, when I was in high school, I um, used to do a lot of science projects because I would make money with science projects. I'd make $75, I'd make $100, et cetera. And when I went to the university to sign up, I was looking at the, I was three people away from the registrar, and I was looking at the um, book and said something called ocean engineering. Actually, the project I did was marine biology, and I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I saw something called ocean engineering, so I said to the lady, I said, I'll do that, because I figured I'll make more money doing that than as a marine biologist. And um, anyway, so I became an engineer, not even knowing the slightest idea of what was an engineer, et cetera. <laughs> and I get to my senior year, and I see something in the program school of urban planning called real estate economics. I said, oh, that sounds interesting, so I take that, and I really liked it. By the way, when I was in engineering school, I worked every day. I worked 30 hours a week. I'd go have lunch at a park, uh, Dante Fasol Park. So one of the things I tell my kids is that when I come back in another life, I want to come back as a college student today, because I want to go, I want to join a frat, I want to go on spring break. So. <laughs> and now I've got the braces, so I'm getting there. <laughs> so, but, um, but everything that happened to me in my life from there was strictly kind of by accident. So um, one of the guys I worked for before, I used to have a bank here called Alan LeVan, said um, success is where opportunity meets preparation. So I've had a series of opportunities that came before me. And, um, and because I, I really ended up liking the real estate business, commercial real estate, I liked the finance business, the capital markets. So I had a series of opportunities that came before me. Um, at one point I ended up joining an all Jewish firm out of New York, Solomon Goldman. I was the only Latin Cuban Catholic guy there. And, um, but an opportunity presented because the old guys were moving out and I, I got an opportunity to move in as a partner, et cetera. And they were listening to the Yiddish state. And they saw my nose. <laughs> yeah. so, so basically, so that when, I, when we put together the firm we put together, um, it's just a bunch of firms that came together. None of us thought at that point, actually we were owned by another firm at one point, none of us thought at that point that we would um, put this together and that at some day we would try to take this company public, which we were able to do. But strictly a series of opportunities that came and just by being very, what I think, very focused and uh, liking the business we do, and, and then things work out as long as you stick to it. And, um, and the last point I was going to make real quick is, is I came, when I graduated from business school, the economy was terrible. Everything looked like it was ending. I remember when I was in high school, the oil prices was a disaster. It looked like everything was ending. And if you just stick to it, things change but stick to it, you really like it, things will work out, there may be some dips, etc., and things will eventually work out. In my business, we, when the uh, financial crisis occurred, people would come to me and say, my God, you guys must be just destroyed, etc." And actually it was one of the best times for us because we just changed our business, we started dealing in distress, etc. So always time to change, but being very passionate about it. So that's it.